warm greetings on behalf of the Wednesdays for Wednesdays for Water, an initiative of the W for W Foundation, a think tank instituted as Citizens Collective. We welcome you to the Biodiversity Series session number six, which is focused on aquatic macrophytes. Wednesdays for Water is a water conversation series towards understanding better the nuances of water conservation and management. The objective is to engage with water experts, grassroots practitioners, policymakers, and particularly youth to learn their thoughts and ideas about these complex intertwined issues which are associated with water and the society at large and look for possible solutions through their ideas. We have expanded to much more activities such as Friday Waters and Monday Munching with Women for Waters. And in Friday Waters, we do water talkies, water arts, water book readings and water thesis. Uh, so we are organizing even physical water workshops, walks and talks, seminars, special courses and conference panels to continue the water conversation. The whole idea is to develop an open access water knowledge repository or we call it knowledge bank of water because water is not much taught in the country. Do visit our website www.w4w.in for more details. As I mentioned, we are running a biodiversity series to bring our conversations actually focus on other species than humans, <laughs> I must say. And to moderate the session, we have Dr. Jayati Chaure. And for today's session on aquatic macrophytes, we have Professor Vipin Vyas and Ganges Reddy as speakers and Raji Lakshmi as discussant. Before I hand it over to um, Jayati, let me just give a brief, brief introduction of uh, Jayati. Dr. Jayati Chauri is the Executive Director at the South Asian Consortium for Interdisciplinary Water Resources Studies very well known as Saki Waters. And she holds a PhD in ecosystem-based uh, and integrated water resource management from IIFF and FRI Dehradun. And let me just hand it over to her because she has vast experience and she will do justice to this session. So over to you, Jethi, and thank you so much for organizing these sessions for us and bringing some insights about other species. Otherwise, we are so obsessed with humans. Over to you. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Manthi, and uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's uh, session. As uh, we all know, uh, that planet Earth is home to a remarkable diversity of species. Uh, scientists estimate that there are anywhere from 8 million to uh, 8 to 10 million species on Earth. It's important to note that uh, the vast majority of these species are still undiscovered, particularly in lesser studied habitats like deep ocean and tropical rainforests. Every species in nature plays a significant ecological role. Every organism has its place and purpose. While we humans are just one among these millions of species, we hold a significant responsibility for the destruction of our other species. Uh, the current status of biodiversity loss is alarming, with empirical data highlighting the magnitude of this issue. According to the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, around 1 million plant and animal species are now threatened with extinction. World Wildlife uh, Fund for Nature's Living Planet report reveals a 69% in wildlife uh, decline in wildlife population. Freshwater species population has suffered an 83% de decline in the last 50 years. It is in this context uh, a series on water and biodiversity is designed. We have our online sessions on every second Wednesday of the month. The aim is to create and develop uh, public awareness on aquatic biodiversity and their conservation status. Uh, this special uh, series takes away the spotlight from Homo sapiens sapiens, uh, modern humans, and shift it to other species with whom we share this planet. The session aims uh, the sessions aim to bring the ecological perspective to the forefront, which is generally absent from mainstream anthropos anthropocentric uh, water discourses. Every session of this series takes you to a new aquatic uh, ecosystem and some amazing species. Uh, this series was launched in uh, February 2023, and uh, we have organized five online sessions on uh, of this series so far. Uh, during our first session, we focused on indigenous freshwater fish uh, biodiversity of India, and then uh, uh, 
second uh, episode was about marine vertebrates. Uh, uh, the third uh, discussed about mammals in aquatic habitat. Uh, fourth one was on coral reef ecosystems. And fifth one was on mangroves. Uh, the recording of all our previous sessions are available on the YouTube channel of uh, W4W uh, Foundation. Uh, so the focus of today's session is on aquatic uh, macrophytes the unsung heroes of the aquatic world. In today's uh, discourse uh, titled Aquatic Macrophytes Beyond Beats to Essential Ecosystem Players, we go beyond the common perception of these plants as uh, just weeds to recognize them as true powerhouse within our aquatic ecosystems. We'll discuss macrophytic biodiversity, exploring their ecological roles and invaluable ecosystem services they provide to our human society as we navigate uh, as we uh, navigate uh, through the session we will discover the potential of macrophytes as nature based solution by harnessing the unique characteristic of these plants we can develop sustainable approaches to water management ecological restoration and climate change resilience as we engage in today's uh, enlightening session discussion, I encourage and request each one of you to actively participate, share your knowledge and ideas, and pose questions during the open group discussion. It is this synergy of thoughts and experience that empowers us to drive meaningful change in our approach to water and biodiversity conservation. Now, I would like to welcome our first distinguished uh, speaker, Professor Vipin Vyas. Uh, Professor Vyas is a renowned limnologist currently working at the Department of Biosciences, Barkatullah University. I would like to share here that uh, Barkatullah University was the first university to offer two years full-time uh, uh, master's program in limnology. Um, I don't know if uh, any other universities have now uh, started offering, but uh, uh, as far as uh, like uh, I know, uh, it's like the only university in India which offers uh, MLC program in uh, limnology. Uh, his research is to, uh, interest areas are aquatic biodiversity, riverine health, aquatic resource conservation, fish farming, water birds. He has extensively worked in Narmada Basin, uh, Tawa, Tapti, Betwa and Betwa River Basins. So, sir, uh, we are grateful um, to you for accepting our uh, invitation to be part of uh, this series. Uh, so, a very warm welcome to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jati. Thank you very much for giving this uh, illustrious introduction. Actually, I am a teacher and I want to be a teacher only. Thank you. Uh, and shall I start? Okay. So the, as a teacher, uh, usually I take one hour uh, to explain my uh, topic, whatever I am teaching. But today uh, I'll try to limit it to 15 minutes as given by the organizers. So can Mansi, can you uh, play the video? Very small video, it's a video clipping actually, just to give you a look of how a uh, macrophyte infested uh, wetland looks like so and uh, while you see the video do you uh, see this, this, this video this this is a very small clipping and you can see that a typical uh, wetland how it looks like it's a typical wetland is full of macrophytes in the marginal area it, uh, some emergent macrophytes are there in the limnetic area or in the middle zone of the wetland uh, uh, there are uh, submerged and floating macrophytes. So you might have seen this types of uh, uh, wetlands and water bodies whenever you are passing through uh, to some rural or even urban areas. So actually, uh, when we see these uh, water bodies, we think that uh, these water bodies are actually full of uh, macrophytes and these macrophytes are very commonly uh, they are aquatic plants and we call them as weed as uh, Jayati has very rightly pointed out but actually are they weeds no actually they are the wealth of our ecosystem as well as they have some economic importance also 
so let us uh, discuss in uh, 15 minutes how these weeds are very important for the aquatic ecosystem and how they are useful for other animals and as well as for humans also so uh, because as uh, jayati has introduced me and uh, jayati has also done uh, her uh, pg in uh, from our department on aquatic ecosystems so we all know that most of the aquatic biodiversity is uh, uh, it remains under water so it's a, it's a very common thing that if something is out of sight it is out of mind but there are certain important biological elements of aquatic ecosystem which are visible and uh, some of them they attract us like birds attract us very much so most of the focus we normally give to birds but the other elements other biological elements of aquatic ecosystem or aquatic biodiversity they are actually they are the unsung heroes of the ecosystem they actually help to run the ecosystem properly they are actually responsible for keeping them healthy so it is very important that we should know about each and every element of aquatic biodiversity and then how to conserve them to understand what is their role in uh, keeping the system healthy and keeping the system balanced that is very important and like uh, these organizers are working for this in our university in our department we are also working on the same lines and apart from imparting the degree uh, of uh, pg and phd and other research activities we are also focusing on outreach activities so that uh, people students particularly our young generation they should come to know about the uh, various aspects of uh, this uh, aquatic ecosystems so this is our uh, goal also our uh, see uh, our objectives are also uh, on the same lines we are working so thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to discuss some important aspects of uh, aquatic macrophytes so as we know that macro is something related to something bigger larger and phytes is a very common word used for plants so they are the larger plants because uh, when we see a green color of uh, surface water of any water body it is actually because of presence of algae and algae is microscopic uh, group of organisms which is present in water but these are macrophytes these are larger plants algae uh, are actually smaller plant microscopic plants both uh, these algal forms and aquatic macrophytes they are actually primary producers primary producers means they convert the solar energy into chemical energy uh, convert it into organic matter and that is the first step where organic matter is fixed in any ecosystem be it terrestrial or aquatic from there it starts the the carbon uh, starts its uh, pathway throughout the ecosystem and finally it emerges either in the form of co2 or in the form of methane so forth so so this these are the basic uh, uh, ecosystem factors which are responsible to keep the ecosystem healthy and alive so as we know that terrestrial plants are found in different forms that uh, angiosperms are they those who have studied botany in uh, schools or colleges they know that uh, plants are uh, can uh, divide them into different forms but i am not going uh, in uh, see taxonomy sort of thing but most of the plant they are either angiosperms or ferns or mosses which are Uh, which we can found uh, sticking to the uh, stones in uh, aquatic ecosystem rivers and water bodies liver worts and macro algae like filamentous algae you may find in running water you may find filamentous algae attached to a stone if you pick a stone from any uh, flowing river you will find slimy growth of uh, macro algae so these are some of the plants which are most of them are found on terrestrial system also but all these forms are found in aquatic ecosystem and every type of uh, plant uh, which i am showing here has its own role in the ecosystem angiosperms ferns mosses liver worts and macro algae so these are the different sorry to interrupt sir but you have not yeah. shared your screen oh sorry 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 okay so yes so these are the uh, different uh, say uh, forms of uh, plants which are normally found in the terrestrial ecosystem and these forms are also uh, we uh, find in the aquatic ecosystem also uh, next please okay so uh, 
when we uh, visit any water body, we see different types of aquatic macrophytes, aquatic plants. Some of them are found in the middle of the water body uh, and some are on the margin of the water body. See, uh, in every water body, these different types of plants, they have their own role in the e ecosystem. Mm -hmm. If we go to the shallower portion of any water body that is also known as wetland, uh, we'll find emergent type of uh, macrophytes or plants which are say emerge out of the water they are rooted in the bottom and they play very important role in recycling of uh, uh, material and particularly uh, various gaseous forms mm -hmm. so these are very important and these rooted plants actually have a root zone system uh, their rhizosphere and they harbor a different type of uh, consortium of uh, microorganisms which play a very important role in recycling the material. I think uh, uh, Mr. Reddy will focus on this issue while uh, he will speak on uh, uh, artificial wetland because they play a very important role in treatment of uh, wastewater uh, in an artificial wetland. So in natural wetland also, they play the similar type of role which they play in the uh, artificial wetland. Similarly, there are certain plants which are rooted but they are not emergent, their leaves are floating on the uh, surface of the water. We are uh, uh, very familiar with the uh, lotus plant or nilumbo plant, which are a ex good example of this type of rooted but floating leaf plants. Similarly, there are certain uh, free floating plants uh, which are uh, emerged out of water. They are rooted below the water surface but they, the roots are not attached to any substrate like mud or any other substrate. So the most common example you all have seen, Icornia, which is an exotic weed in India. That is real weed, but that is also very useful. I will explain how it is useful also. So this Icornia is actually a floating plant. It has roots. Uh, a dense root system is there below the water. So this is an example of uh, this uh, floating, floating and rooted plants. Then comes the uh, these uh, submerged plants. Hydra, uh, I think we all have seen hydra in our uh, school laboratory, and we have done the experiment of oxygen liberation from the uh, aquatic plants. So if you keep uh, hydra in a beaker, it will release uh, bubbles of oxygen. That is an example of how plants do photosynthesis because that is not possible in terrestrial system. So in aquatic system, we can very easily understand the process of photosynthesis with the help of hydrilla. So hydrilla is an example of uh, submerged plants which are found in the middle of the uh, water body. So if a water body is having all these types of plants from marginal area, from the littoral zone to the middle of the water body, these all plants play very important role in running different ecosystem services, ecological processes in a water body. Uh, next, please. Next, please. Next. Next. Uh, I think next. Next one. Okay. So, uh, see here, uh, I have uh, shown some uh, pictures also how these plants are very useful for aquatic ecosystem. Uh, because the previous two slides are more uh, see uh, on scientific side. So let us discuss on uh, see uh, as a layman, I'm explaining you. So how, how these uh, plants are very important because these plants serve as food for many animals. Uh, some fishes are dependent uh, on uh, uh, these plants. Like uh, there is a fish, although it is exotic, grass carp, it is actually uh, used in aquaculture. Uh, and it has very good taste value and market value also. So these types of fishes actually depend on the uh, macrophytes as their food. Then uh, some other birds like uh, migratory birds, foods and other migratory birds, they are also dependent on the uh, aquatic macrophytes. Some of the, the uh, birds, they are very fond of the uh, tubers and the roots of aquatic macrophytes. So they uh, dig up the uh, sediment, marginal sediment, and they uh, remove the tubers of the uh, macrophytes and they feed on it. So uh, in this way, they provide um, very good food value to uh, different type of animals which are uh, 
present in water and even for some uh, terrestrial uh, animals also uh, they provide for cattle they provide food for cattle also so this is uh, one of the most important aspect of aquatic macrophytes then they provide very good shelter or refuge to various or uh, organisms you can see here in these uh, pictures if you can see that uh, uh, different types of uh, see uh, some insects are there uh, some of the insect they actually lay eggs on the uh, surface of the leaves or below the surface of the leaves on the stems and uh, if you remove a, a plant from the water you may find that there are slimy uh, growth or some nest sort of thing is there on the leaves or on the stem. Actually, uh, these types of uh, formations on the macrophytes, they are actually, uh, they are nests of various organisms, insects. So they provide shelter, they provide breeding grounds to various organisms, they breed on it, they lay eggs on it. They sometimes they find refuge because uh, they have to escape from the predators. So they uh, these plants offer a refuge for them to escape from the uh, from their predators. So in this way they are uh, they play very important role. You can see here in a in a picture here you can see that uh, uh, the leaves are uh, eaten by some insects. Uh, small uh, holes are there on the leaf. So th this this may be. Uh, the food of some uh, insect which is which is feeding on this leaf and you can see uh, an odonate is there which is also uh, getting refuge or getting shelter uh, on the aquatic macrophytes the most important thing is they actually they uh, function as a filter uh, for the water which is com coming from the catchment area we all know we we have been talking about pollution in many other sessions also. So uh, if some uh, pollution or uh, silt is coming from the catchment area and it is entering into the water body, actually if, if the water body is surrounded by uh, good growth of uh, emergent and submerged macrophytes, these macrophytes actually act as filter for the uh, these type of pollutants. They uh, sometimes they filter the silt which is coming from the catchment. Sometimes they absorb excess uh, pollutants, excess nutrients coming from the uh, catchment area. So they uh, work as filters. So if we remove, uh, we have seen in many areas that uh, plants are removed as weed. They understand that it is a weed and it should be removed. But if you remove all the plants from the water body, it is not good for the uh, health of the water body because uh, the whole uh, contamination which is coming from the catchment area will enter the water body and it may create different types of problems in the water body. So uh, these uh, uh, plants actually, they function uh, as filter for the water body. So there should be a the growth of uh, macrophytes around a water body to keep it healthy. That is also very important. And as uh, I have discussed earlier also, the root zone system of the uh, aquatic plants, um, whether it is uh, a rooted plant, it is uh, rooted in the mud or the roots are floating in the water. These roots actually support a consortia of microbes of different types of bacteria, protozoans, and uh, other decomposers, which play a very important role in decomposition of organic matter. See, uh, today the most important uh, aspect of water pollution is ent entering the organic matter from the catchment area, which is causing depletion of oxygen and many other problems. So these roots, the microbes, um, which are attached to the roots of these uh, uh, plants, they actually help in decomposition of the organic matter and they help in the uh, treatment of waste. So similar thing which uh, Mr. Reddy is doing and he will explain in detail. So uh, th these are some of the important uh, see uh, role of uh, macrophytes which they play in the ecosystem. Next please. Okay, so apart from uh, providing uh, shelter and food and uh, other important aspects to the aquatic uh, organisms and aquatic ecosystems, actually wetlands are very important for us also as they provide, it, provide us uh, different types of food material. You can see here, I have taken this picture from uh, internet, uh, but you can see here that uh, uh, there is a paddy field. 
and these paddy fields are actually wetlands and paddy is a wetland plant so it is providing uh, food to half or uh, see two third population of the world so it is very important uh, secondly uh, you are seeing this water chestnut which is commonly in bhopal it is very commonly or in north india it is known as singara uh i don't know uh, what, what it is called in different parts of the country but in the northern part of the country it is called as singara this is very uh, nutritious uh, water product fruit and it is very rich in various uh, types of minerals and carbohydrate and all these uh, important uh, see elements which are required for our body it is cultivated and it provides livelihood opportunity for uh, uh, a huge uh, see uh, amount of uh, see uh, a good amount of population is dependent on the cultivation of this uh, chapa uh, in various water bodies particularly in bihar uh, uttar pradesh uh, madhya pradesh rajasthan and other northern part of the india and in uh, many other parts of the country so it is very important for uh, these population to uh, keep the water body healthy and uh, the whole practice of cultivating this chapa although in some areas they are using nowadays they are using they have started using pesticides on these uh, chapa but still it is giving a good opportunity livelihood opportunity as well as nutritional support to uh, uh, the population of the country so this water chestnut apart from this you might have uh, um, seen uh, this uh, stem of uh, lotus which is also very nutritious and it is uh, a good delicacy also so these are uh, macrophytes which uh, serve as food in addition to fishes uh these plants are also very useful for us and the, they all are wetland plants so the, in this way these plants are very useful for humans also next please see uh as i have told you earlier also that uh, uh apart from giving a degree and doing scientific research and uh, doing phd we are also engaged in outreach activities we uh, um, uh, we actually um, organize uh, various field visits and training programs and awareness programs for school students for our college students for our own students so that they can understand the role of aquatic plants and uh, they visit the local wetlands we have uh, very fortunately we have a uh, bhoj wetland in bhopal it's a ramsar site and uh, about uh, two third of the uh, this uh, wetland is covered or infested with aquatic macrophytes and around 120 type of uh, different species of uh, macrophytes are found here so uh, we uh, take the students to wetlands uh, they we allow them to enter the water body and see how these uh, plants are distributed in different forms in the water body how emergent plants they their roots and all these things so you can see uh, some of the pics i have uh, shown here so this is also a part of our activity these outreach activities are also uh, we are holding such type of uh, type of activities in our uh department in our university and the uh, students from schools and colleges they every year they uh, come to our department to see the uh, different uh, research work going on in the aquatic ecosystem as well as we organize field visits also and we have various organizations like rmnh uh, regional museum of natural history we have apo here pollution control board and other uh, organizations they also organize various activities in collaboration with us so uh, this was a brief uh, introduction about the macrophytes i think i am within the time mansi um, not really but jayati will take it over thank okay, you okay 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 so thank you very much thank you thank you thank you thank you uh thank you uh, vipin sir we are grateful for your enlightening presentation and the knowledge you have imparted to us and now i would like to um, invite our next uh, very special guest uh, uh, mr gangadhar reddy um, known among professional circles as ganges reddy 
Uh, he is an environmental sustainability expert and is the founder and CEO of uh, Blue Drop, Drop uh, and Bureau Pri uh, Private Limited. Uh, so, a very warm uh, welcome to you, sir. Uh, Thank you very much, Jayati. Thank you, Mansa, for uh, the brilliant uh, sessions that you've been doing every Wednesday and some of them are on Fridays. Thank you, Dr. Vyas, uh, for your enlightening session on uh, macrophytes. So uh, I'm on the other side of the uh, street, you know, looking at these macrophytes from an application point of view. Uh, today, most of the water bodies have been polluted across the nation in a lot of rivers and uh, in other surface waters in a, in a, in a dreadful state. So as a company, uh, um, I run Blue Drop Enviro. We practice uh, constructed wetlands based CBS treatment and effluent treatment, where we use these macrophytes significantly. So the kind of research that has been done on this is significant, and we bring this to an application. I will show you some of uh, uh, our works very quickly, and then I will walk you through some of the videos where we are applying these macrophytes uh, for uh, remediation purposes. Can you see my screen? Yes, please continue. All right. So this is one of the uh, treatment plant that we are treating about uh, 2.4 MLD of wastewater coming from a township uh, where there are shock loads of 30, 30, 30 to 40,000 people. Then they visit the campus and other times there are only two to 3,000 people. So this sewage treatment plant that you see on the left uh, caters to that kind of loads and people walk by and they don't understand what it is doing. Some people think it's a nursery. Some people think it's a bushy area but it is quietly treating the wastewater. And you can see on the left side, this was an earlier version of a sewage treatment plant, which is a passive wetlands. And this was converted into uh, aerated wetlands by rebuilding it with some aeration techniques. But in both the systems, you can see different kinds of macrophytes. These are other systems. Uh, there's one in built in Raipur where we collect the municipal wastewater uh, coming from Inala. Uh, screen it for plastics, etc., solid waste, and then bring the water into the system, treat that, and offer that water for their process needs in this uh, steel uh, company, uh, RRS Path. So these macrophytes are used to treat a Nala wastewater coming from some villages around there. And this is another place, Nisa, Hyderabad, where uh, a hostel of resident, uh, you know, uh, staff, you know, the sewage comes into this. Uh, it gets treated and then used to feed the, you know, actually cater to the golf course right behind this, you know, sewage treatment plant. Um, here we find another interesting case study to the left. This is a common effluent treatment plant where 14 different industries do send their uh, different kinds of waste waters that are handled um, through this multi basin constructed wetlands is a passive wetlands. The studies that were done on these wetlands are outstanding. I'll share that with you at appropriate time, but um, this quietly uh, treats and, you know, a physically handicapped, very elderly person manages this entire CETP. We don't have engineers managing this once it's built. So these macrophytes are playing a, a good decent role. You can see certain basins with different, different uh, dedicated species. Uh, there are typha here, the cypress papyrus here. There's uh, Canna Indica here, there's Thalia Dalbeta there, and some of them um, uh, probably uh, Cypress Salt Familias. So there are different kinds of species that you can distinctly see here. And this is another uh, training facility in Jodhpur, uh, Rural Self-Employment Training Institute, uh, where all these, this is a green campus. It's a platinum rated building. They wanted to have a nature-based solution only to match their uh, philosophy. So this is quietly working right next to their working space, you know, 20 KLD. Here, another case of a Nala treatment where the polluted water is flowing through Nala. As a pilot, we were asked to build a sewage treatment plant. So we picked up this water, fed this uh, constant wetlands-based sewage treatment plant. It nicely treats it. And here, another case, you know, it's not a greeting card. It's a sewage treatment plant. It's colorful. We love it. This is again nature-based solution, passive wetland system. We didn't want to spend a lot of money here. So everything was done with, uh, you know, earthen burns and some HDP liners. So this is in University of Hyderabad. So, you know, these macrophytes, you know, they, a lot of things happen within the constructed wetlands paradigm where the symbiotic association between the bacteria that is there at the root and the plant, that plays the major role in remediating the wastewater. It's not necessary that the macrophytes are absorbing everything for its their growth. All the nutrients, some of them actually use them for their growth, just the way the crop uh, we use gober in the fields. 
Similarly, whatever is a uh, is obnoxious matter for us, something that we don't like, you know, the fecal matter, food, all that is actually food for these plants. And the bacteria actually decomposes them, and certain elements are picked up by the uptake by the plants, and rest of them are stored as in the, their shoots. So these macrophytes are also capable of uh, not just handling the biological content, but they can also absorb heavy metals into their shoots. You know, there are cases where uh, arsenic was treated uh, through phytoremediation. There are, it's a, not an uncommon experience that mining wastewaters are handled through uh, the constructed wetlands where uh, some of these plants do uptake um, uh, these heavy metals. So there's a quite an intense uh, you know, a science behind this whole thing. And this science has been very vastly explored and implemented in the Western world than it is done in India. We are quite late in adopting nature-based sea-based treatment plants through phytoremediation or constructed wetlands. There are thousands and thousands of case studies, papers are published all over the world. And there are several significant engineering advances done integrating certain advanced techniques to remediate very advanced pollutants, you know, petrocarbons, hydrocarbons, all of that through this technology. And India is now waking up to this opportunity and towns are slowly moving towards it. I would say slowly. But if adapted widely, we would see a transformative uh, impact on our climate. When you look back uh, on these uh, kind of, you know, imagine this kind of a treatment system in your backyard. Imagine this kind of a treatment system in your town or in your uh, colony. It just is so, uh, you know, heartwarming to see nature do your job and you won't even realize that there is Gandapan here. You know, it's everything... All that we don't want, nature is able to handle it very, very well. The designing has to be done right. So look at different species that we use. We have identified you know, more than 21 different species that we use based on the nature of the wastewater, based on the tedious levels, hardness, what kind of COD is there, you know, things, uh, things like that. And if, if it is heavy metals, we also look at the scheme, treatment scheme, whether we have a lagoon before, whether we have a, a, a bioremediation that we do before and all that. So... These are some of the species that we use that you can commonly see in different parts of India. And often when you see these plants, you can certainly say that there is flow of water there, sometimes clean water, sometimes unclean water. Many of these plants relish uh, the sewage waters, refluents, and some of the plants indicate what is in the soil, what is in the water based on and their predominant growth. Some of these plants do not grow as much in the soil as they grow in uh, wastewaters because they really get enough nutrients for their growth there. So these are several names here. Some of them, they, they have characteristics here. Uh, each one performs similar job, but different jobs. Um, so these are the popularly known uh, species that I'm showing you here. I used to you know, watch, I mean, uh, not all of these, at least, I'm familiar with six or eight different species since my childhood, you know, growing up in village. I've seen this around our lakes and water bodies. But unfortunately now, you know, the, all the lakes and water bodies have been dredged in a way or you know, excavated in a way that, you know, you don't seem to have a lot of the uh, sh shallow water surfaces. We need those shallow water uh, surfaces where these wetland plants can grow and protect. It's, it's a beautiful concept. The nature has the design. It's just that, you know, our people... Some of us didn't understand it well, and since decades we have been mishandling these water bodies. Otherwise, they could have handled these uh, pollutants very, very uh, easily. So these are the uh, species that I've, uh, we are using in these plants. All these are applied. I would like to show you a, a live video of uh, a sewage treatment plant, and that would give you a good understanding of uh, how the sequence of activities happen. Can you see my screen? Yes, yes, please continue. All right. To take you through a live video of one of our sea waste treatment plants in Hyderabad, you can see the wastewater um, coming in uh, from various sources into this holding tank. This holding tank is, tank is designed specifically for uh, sea waste treatment functionality through considered wetlands. Here you can see the first basin of the considered wetlands having healthy plants and they have grown uh, close to about nine feet tall. 
these are surface points you must be wondering why this is gravel what is this liner see the whole principle is that this wastewater shouldn't get in touch with uh, any soil so causing soil pollution so we line this uh, surface ponds designed for the wetlands uh, with hdp liners and geotextile liners and the entire hydrology is designed uh, based on the pollutant level within the wastewater you can see the extent of uh, treatment plant uh, there are various sections of different plantation you can see anybody passing by probably feel that this is a park may not even notice that there is something happening at the root zone the entire action happens at the root zone of this uh, treatment plant these plants are aquatic plants you can see the tubular structure of this uh, stem these this plant that we are seeing is cypress papyrus you have heard about uh, paper so the paper manufacturing the, was produced out of these papyrus plants in the olden days. So the gravel is installed in different layers, uh, ranging from 10 mm to 60 mm. And uh, the entire uh, hydrology design on the pipelines are laid uh, below the gravel. And various uh, species of plantation is done. The way these uh, plants are thriving, if you take the same plant and plant it over a ground in soil, it wouldn't grow this much these plants thrive on this pollutants that we don't like. Well, they are thriving, but at the same time, they are remediating the water. In this constructed wetlands, we don't separate the waste from the water. We actually remediate the waste. The sludge is consumed in the holding tank partially, and at the root zone system of these plants, there are microbial colonies that develop and they proliferate significantly. And we provide a large uh, uh, surface area for these microbes to encroach on. That's where the pollutants settle and then the microbes act on them. And the roots are so well uh, established in this gravel that there's a microfiber root system that develops at the root zone. This is a canna species plant. You can see the flowering. So uh, while I was describing this root system, at the root, these plants release hydroxyl ions nascent axis is available that's where the majority of the water remediation happens along with the microbial action and you can see the output quality of water it's order free color free it meets the pcb norms any day the bod levels are way below 30s and cod are below 100. in this system we have never used any chemicals there is no mechanical equipment present and you don't need any technical people here so uh, a lot more can be spoken about this but in want of time i would uh, conclude that this is the most natural way of treatment and this is sustainable economical it brings a lot of biodiversity and eco ecological balance together while treating the water which is the primary cause thank you for watching this video any questions please contact us to take it forward thank you so i hope uh, it has given you some a good deal of understanding of uh, how a nature-based solution uh, can be applied to uh, treat the uh, wastewaters. I will yet show you another uh, quick video. This is what you have seen is in a rustic setup. And now we're talking about urban spaces. Majority of the population is in urban spaces. People complain that we don't have enough opportunity to do nature-based solutions. But uh, contrary to what people uh, believe, we're able to demonstrate the application of uh, uh, nature-based solutions in a thick concrete jungle where you barely have uh, a space. So, uh, can you see my screen now? Yes. So, this is... Uh, uh, this is another sewage treatment plant that we have built. This uh, caters to about 215 families living in an urban setup where the sewage treatment plant Every day it receives the water, treats the water quietly. This is one of their garden areas. And we requested that, you know, this garden area, they have about five of these similar garden areas. So we requested that one of the garden area can be left for us to demonstrate the sewage treatment here. Um, and they gladly agreed. And we have done this. It's been functional more than a year and a half. All that the residents would notice here is that there is a garden. They would not know that this is a sewage treatment plant quietly doing this, built with a very advanced technology that there is some aeration system set up at the bottom of the wetland. But if you can see the bedrooms and balconies, there's a good morning for them every day with STP, which is a very uncommon. Usually STP sewage treatment means people run away and they don't buy things around that. But here we change the story around 
a nature based solution with this micro macrophytes is functioning very effectively delivering a very good quality of uh, water treated water that people are using it for gardens and other purposes so we have done a little bit of mechanization around this where we provide slight aeration and all that this is uh, barely 20% of the energy that conventional mechanical systems use with just that 20% energy we are able to run the entire show um, because the solution brings the nature's strength the bacteria and the plants they work for free the rest of the engineering is what we are doing and we are able to achieve greater level of efficiency here so uh, so these are the applications that uh, we have been doing it we have been treating uh, dairy waste water which has a high level of bods and cods we have, we have treated the water from food industry uh, we have done some projects for uh, cement industries the reason i mention all of these thing is nature has all the power and may not be applicable in every scenario but large cases you know today i can take you one quick example that if india decides to go towards nature based solutions and adopt these kind of solutions instantly instantly we can sequester thousands of tons of carbon without paying a rupee for it and instantly we can cut down the cost of uh, energy when you cut down the cost of energy not only you are cutting down the cost of energy but you are reducing the carbon emission that are coming out of fossil fuels and all this is possible because nature has had these solutions since we have intensified the pollutions using uh, pollution using hard pigs and all kinds of chemicals in our uh, in a in a household every industry is producing different kinds of effluents so the systems have to be engineered to deliver uh, our agreements with pollution control board norms or ngt norms which are only meant to help save the surface waters being polluted in a constantly on a daily basis so that's all i have uh, from my side uh, i would be glad to take any questions or any discussion around this thank you very much for the opportunity to present and for all the viewers here yeah thank you so much uh, ganjeet uh, it's great to see your passion and dedication to developing nature based solution which is uh, need of the art and it's truly inspiring uh so now i would like to invite uh, our youth discussant uh, raji lakshmi she is uh, a student of srm university andhra pradesh and she is currently pursuing her final year of uh, ba uh, her interests include safe drinking water safe sanitation and gender studies uh, so raji lakshmi i would uh, request you to lead this session you can ask your questions first and then we'll quickly pick up uh, some questions from the chat box uh, the chat box and also invite some of the audience uh, to uh, uh ask their uh, questions uh, so over to you raja lakshmi i really thank you for this wonderful opportunity i really want to mention that i have gained a lot of knowledge because previously when i was doing another internship i had to go through a lake and a pond and then even i felt like you know these aquatic plants are or algae on the level of water are really harmful for the fishes or anything but now i got to an understanding that they are also really important uh, i just have a few questions so i wanted to ask this to vipin sir sir uh, do you think many aquatic plants i mean sorry do you think many aquatic animals are being extinct just because of removing these aquatic plants from the surface yes definitely raj lakshmi very good question uh if we remove because they uh, provide uh, habitat food and many other uh, support to the aquatic animals or other organisms even breeding grounds for many aquatic uh, animals if we remove them from the water body without considering their ecological significance that will definitely be harmful and it may lead to extinction of uh, any of the species which is dependent on it on the uh, aquatic macrophytes uh for uh, their breeding for food for shelter for refuge so like the uh, terrestrial if we see the terrestrial system if we remove trees uh, we remove nests of many birds we remove uh, uh, habitat of many insects and other species similarly happens in the aquatic system if we remove these plants definitely it is detrimental to the uh, biodiversity of that uh, water body apart from nutrients and other things it is harmful for biodiversity of the water body also sir 
will there be any physical change in the body like you know reducing the depth of what i mean reducing the depth of the leg or any other uh, sources yes if we remove the uh, plants from the margin of the water body as i told you earlier that uh, actually these plants act as filter for uh, the water which is coming from the catchment area if the plants are not there uh, it uh, the water which is coming from the catchment area it brings uh, silt from the catchment it brings pollutants from the catchment so if silt is coming from the catchment definitely it will reduce the depth of the water body if pollutants are entering the water body it will contaminate the whole ecosystem so removing these plants sometimes we we need to remove them but not uh, complete deweeding is uh, recommended if we see it scientifically if we see engineering uh, intervention only no ecological intervention then sometimes we see that the whole uh, uh, amount of weed is removed from the water body that is not good for it sir thank you sir sir uh, mr reddy i really i have i really have to congratulate you on your amazing uh, projects that you have been doing and uh, i am uh, really not familiar with the construction of wet plants but when i heard about you explaining it i really want to know uh, will i mean when you remove those macrophytes from the open drain will it will it have any effect towards the ecology or uh, the drains see these are uh, quietly doing their work you know every time the water passes through these root systems the bacteria is sitting there doing its work quietly so any time we remove this aquatic what we call weeds there are, as mentioned its weeds of the well they are doing their job and when we remove them that part of the functionality is affected so naturally if you actually have a broader channel that's running for a couple of kilometers and it has macrophytes on either sides of the banks and water is constantly touching their uh, roots i'm sure the water is continuing to be treated as natural oxygenation happens through interaction with ambient air so much also the roots of these plants will be releasing certain level of oxygen into the water streams and bacteria continues to decompose the waste so there is a significant symbiotic uh, work that is happening naturally and when you remove these things they will be affected for sure thanks sir i am little curious about your project like as you have mentioned earlier that you are uh, you know what do you say you are recycling the water right i have to mention it in a line yeah, yeah. we are we are recycling the water idea is to you know make the water be available again you know that's why our company uh, slogan is giving water a second life so what we consider as you know uh, a dirty water that is not usable anymore we actually treat it bring it to a level the purpose can be different you know you, you may be wanting to flush the water so we can yeah. bring it to flush quality you want to just irrigate the your lawns and garden so we can bring the water to irrigation quality somebody wants to take it back into the processing you know one of the uh, deccan cements we have done a project they take the entire water into the cement industry so by actually setting up these units we are able to address the water security that you are not going to any more take the fresh water when you have treated water available that's good enough you know one crime that we are all committing as of uh, today is so many so many so many communities are giving fresh water to the plants and lawns and the community is dying to get water this is craziness so we cannot do this in the 21st century where we are really really struggling for water so every drop of water must be treated in whatever method you can adopt of course nature based solutions are the one of the best methods and economical methods doing the same thing and if the water can be reused for all these purposes you would have been cutting down that much of demand on the water sir i am little curious uh, to know what would you raju lakshmi uh, maybe uh, you can uh, uh, continue the discussion later because we have time constraint so we can uh, invite other audience to ask their questions and uh, i also have one question can i ask sure yeah. <laughs> yes. so it's for uh, both the uh, speakers so uh, generally in our mainstream water resources management approach uh, uh, 
like these uh, macrophytes are uh, projected as villains and uh, like they are, uh, they actually uh, uh, like there's uh, this misconception that uh, they impact uh, uh, the whole ecosystem uh, negatively uh, and they and uh, these approach also uh, these approaches also recommend their indiscriminative uh, indiscriminate harvesting of these plants so i would like to understand like are there any policy instrument uh, which we can use to advocate um, uh, to uh, like promote uh, sustainable management of these aqu uh, aquatic macrophytes because these aquatic macrophytes are not the villain but the problem is that uh, our uh, like uh, runoff from our catchment area which contains uh, pollutants or uh, nutrient rich uh, runoff uh, causes this excessive growth of uh, macrophytes which is harmful uh, to the environment uh, aquatic environment so are there any uh, kind of uh, policies or uh, schemes or programs which we can use uh, to um, advocate that uh, like uh, these uh, plants are also resources they are not just weeds uh, can I answer this, uh, Mr. Reddy? Yes, okay. yes sir, please. So, uh, actually, it's a very good question, Jayati, because ultimately the whole thing goes to the uh, level of implementation and policy makers. See, in, uh, uh, we have to be very, see, um, see uh, the whole uh, thing is to be calculated properly because, uh, see, what happens uh, if, if we, we are using the water body as a, uh, as a resource, so when we talk about the resource, it means we are trying to uh, get some uh, economic benefit out of it. But if we consider uh, it as an ecosystem, then the whole things uh, come into picture. Actually, what we are doing, we are uh, seeing these uh, ecosystems as resources. We call them water resources, forest resources, mineral resources, this resources that is actually they are the ecosystem. So first thing is, uh, if we adopt ecosystem approach uh, in uh, uh, maintaining the water bodies and other ecosystems or other resources, that will be uh, you know, beneficial for both the uh, ecosystems and as well as for us. As you told that uh, uh, the, this uh, ecosystem approach, like in case of uh, wetlands, the new wetland rules which have been notified by the Ministry of Environment and Forests, uh, not directly macrophytes, but it, uh, it gives uh, some space for uh, ecological considerations while managing these wetlands like we are seeing in our Bhoj wetland a massive project was uh, I think Jayati you were here when this uh, whole Bhoj wetland project was implemented actually removal of weeds sometimes uh, 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 these weed can reduce the water holding capacity or water storage capacity if the, uh, the growth of the plants is um, excessive growth then it can uh, reduce the water holding capacity of a water body. So it depends on the use, like uh, Ramsar uh, convention says wise use of wetlands. So there is no definition as such of wise use, but according to the local conditions and availability of resources and how much we are using, we have to decide the wise use of the wetland. Well, while doing wise use of the wetland, we have to see whether this wetland or water body is to be used to store more water for our drinking purpose or for our industrial purpose and other things. And similarly, if we introduce uh, water recycling like Mr. Reddy is uh, contributing in a great manner. So if we uh, introduce or if we adopt such type of uh, water recycling technologies, uh, we can definitely reduce our dependency on the water body and then its storage capacity will not affect us much. So this type of approach, uh, ecosystem approach and considering the resource as an ecosystem will definitely be helpful. And nowadays, uh, ministries and governments are coming up with new rules and uh, regulations. Um, I don't know how much uh, uh, the implementing agency is able to uh, uh, adopt it and implement it uh, on the field, but definitely these uh, regulations and these approaches will be helpful. Uh, Mr. Reddy will like to say some more about this. Yes, I think uh, like uh, instead of uh, addressing the root cause, we try to treat the symptoms. So that's the problem with our approaches. Uh, yes, Mr. Reddy. 
Uh, also, the partly the you know, your question also relates to you know the current situation with the lakes and water bodies, where you know we see water, growth of water heights and then another kind of uh, you know aquatic plants significantly to the tune that you know that the entire water body is covered densely with these macrophytes, and then they deprive the water body of any sunlight and you know, uh, oxygen contact, air contact. Then then the gradually the anaerobic decay sets in. Once the anaerobic decay sets in, now the, the entire food web starts to pass out. So finally, you'll end up in a, in a situation that the waters become so toxic with the continuation of addition of uh, uh, pollutants that, you know, now you neither have macrophytes, nor have bacteria, nor no fish, nothing. So in the case of, uh, you know, these uh, water hyacinths and such floating uh, uh, plants that are deploying water body of uh, these things, we may have to regulate them, you know, based on the, again, it comes down to, you know, how much of pollutants are we letting in so even the pollutants are letting in if the, if the frequently uh, the water hyacinth etc can be harvested uh, it's it's a great plant you know it actually does the remediation but the overgrowth is a problem so there has to be an organized way of you know removing of these uh, you know plants and there can be biodiesel etc other applications are coming if the volumes are higher so there can be a circular economy around this if you are able to you know manage this so maybe there could be a like uh, uh, integrated or holistic uh, plan to um, address uh, eutrophication of uh, these water bodies. Uh, yeah. I would also like to understand like um, uh, uh, like recently, uh, government of India they launched this theme called uh, Amrit Darohar, which is meant to uh, protect uh, aquatic biodiversity. So can that uh, uh, scheme be used? Uh, in all the ponds, so or it's like only limited to uh, Ramsar sites because I could not find much information about uh, this theme. So maybe you or uh, Professor Vipin can I'll pass that to Professor Vipin. He must be more familiar with these Ramsar sites. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah, so this is about uh, Amrit Darohar schemes, so or like uh, which was launched yeah, yes, uh, this yes, year. Yes, there, uh, Jaiti. Uh, but it will take uh, some time to be implemented on the field because uh, there are so many other schemes to conserve biodiversity. And secondly, uh, those who are uh, see connected with this uh, this whole session, uh, either uh, in the online meeting or through YouTube or whatever, they I I request them to please uh, uh, try to see if their area is having any biodiversity management committee BMC. Uh, which is nowadays uh, mandatory for uh, all the see gram panchayas and uh, see your, uh, municipal committees and corporations. So if a biodiversity management committee is there, uh, you can approach the biodiversity management committee. And if any water body is there and aquatic biodiversity is to be uh, see uh, it is uh, under threat and is to be conserved, they, they these. Uh, BMCs can help a lot because they are empowered to uh, prepare a register of the local biodiversity and uh, they can pass on to the implementing agency for its conservation. So such type of uh, Amrat Dharohar and other schemes are there, but the implementing agency, we should uh, uh, have another session on it, uh, on the biodiversity management committees, how they function and how to reach them. And, how to strengthen them. So uh, if uh, these types of uh, local, uh, we can say them authority because it's a part of the whole biodiversity act, uh, these BMCs. So we can approach them to uh, adopt uh, such type of uh, activities or to include wetlands, wetland plants and aquatic biodiversity also, because that is the most neglected part. I have seen many BMCs working in our area. Uh, under the state biodiversity board. So aquatic biodiversity is uh, the, the most neglected part of the whole biodiversity scenario. So uh, that is also the need of the hour. Thank you so much, uh, sir. So um, Raji Lakshmi, uh, maybe you can invite uh, audience to ask their questions. Namaste, sir. Namaste, ma'am. Namaste. My um, question really says, how you maintain the dissolved oxygen level during the whole process? Uh, 
रेडी साहब आपका माइक बंद है तो सॉरी इसमें दो चीजें हैं एक पैसे वेटलैंड जो है जो जैसा हम पौधे यू नो ट्रीज रिलीज ऑक्सीजन फ्रॉम द फ्रॉम द लीव्स एंड ऑल दैट दे आल्सो रिलीज ऑक्सीजन एट द बॉटम ऑफ द वेटलैंड रूट्स रूट्स से भी ये ऑक्सीजन निकलता है सो द ऑक्सीजन दैट कम्स यूजुअली इन कन्वेंशनल मैकेनिकल सिस्टम्स में क्या करते हैं हम एंबियंट एयर लेके उनको भेजते हैं यू नो वी पुश इट थ्रू द ब्लोवर्स इनटू द इनटू द वाटर टू इंक्रीज द डी ओ लेवल्स एंड यू नो रिड्यूस द बी ओ डी सी ओ डी वहां पे इफ यू टेक अ टन ऑफ एयर यू नो यू गेट 20% ऑक्सीजन नेट ऑक्सीजन ट्रांसफर इज समवेयर अराउंड 2 टू 3% समटाइम्स मच लेसर यहां पे नेसेंट ऑक्सीजन जैसा ऑक्सीजन लीव से रिलीज होता है वैसा ऑक्सीजन नीचे जड़ से मिलता है सो ऑक्सीजन लेवल्स आर वेरी वेल मेंटेन व्हिच एक्चुअली हेल्प्स द माइक्रोब्स टू बैक्टीरियल कॉलोनीज टू डेवलप एंड इन अर्बन एरियाज में क्या हो रहा है इतना जगह नहीं मिल रहा है इसीलिए हम एरेटेड वेटलैंड्स को लेके आए जहाँ नीचे से हम एरेशन दे रहे हैं बिकॉज ऑफ विच यू गेट एक्सटर्नल एरेशन ऑल्सो विच हेल्प द नेचुरल एरेशन एंड बिकॉज ऑफ विच द डी ओ लेवल सर वेल मेंटेन एंड बी ओ डी सी ओ डी सर रिड्यूस सिग्निफिकेंटली नॉर्मली एनरोबिक जोन जब क्रिएट हो जाता है थोड़ा एनवायरमेंटल इम्पैक्ट होता है मीथेन एमिशन होते हैं सो वी आर ट्राइंग टू अवॉइड द एनोरोबिक डी के थोड़ा मैं ऐड करूं रेड्डी साहब आपके पास जो एक्वेटिक प्लांट जो आपने प्रश्न पूछा आप किसी भी एक्वेटिक प्लांट को लेके अगर आप थोड़ा सा उसको उसका स्टेम अगर तोड़ेंगे तो आपको अंदर से पूरा स्पॉन्जी लगता है कभी ये एक्सपीरियंस करके देखिए थोड़ा सा किसी वाटर बॉडी पे जाके तो वो इसलिए होता है बिकॉज दे हैव एरन कामेट इशूज जो पूरा ऊपर से नीचे तक एक ट्यूब बना देते हैं उसके रूट से लेके ऊपर जो पानी के बाहर जो पार्ट निकला तो दिस इज फॉर गैशियस एक्सचेंज तो इस पूरे ट्यूब के थ्रू जो एरन कामेट इश्यूज होते हैं इनके थ्रू एक तो पानी पे फ्लोट करता है वो दूसरा जो गैशियस एक्सचेंज होता है और एटमॉस्फेयर से ऑक्सीजन रूट जोन तक जाती है और रूट जोन से जैसा आपने डीजी बता रहे हैं कि मिथेन वगैरह का एमिशन भी होता है तो दिस दिस टिश्यूज वर्क लाइक सी ट्यूब्स एंड कैपेलरी सॉर्ट ऑफ तो इस तरीके से गैशियस एक्सचेंज होता है जो रूट जोन को एरेटेड रखता है but yes if load is more then definitely there will be an oxic condition which is not uh, see recommended in such type of systems to us case mein ye jo artificial aeration ka radiology bata rahe hain to it is a hybrid type of system otherwise uh, agar uh, inka aeration climate issues theek se kaam kar rahe hain aur load agar sirf if we are using for polishing of the uh, your tertiary we are giving tertiary treatment then uh, such type of uh, इस तरह की फिर चीजों की शायद जरूरत नहीं पड़ती लेकिन अगर हम प्राइमरी या सेकेंडरी ट्रीटमेंट दे रहे हैं तो डेफिनेटली इसमें ऑक्सीजन रिडक्शन की पॉसिबिलिटीज होती है थैंक यू फॉर पिचिंग सर मैं एक क्वेश्चन और पूछ सकता हूँ सर आपसे प्लीज गो हेड हेलो सर क्या हम आपका जो ये मॉडल है इसको हम रेप्लीकेट कर सकते हैं अपने हाउस जो लिक्विड वेस्ट निकलता है उसको ट्रीट करने के लिए बिल्कुल कर सकते हैं क्यों नहीं ये हर स्केल पे काम करता है यू नो इट इज वेरी मच पॉसिबल टू रेप्लीकेट इन स्मॉलर फॉर हाउस होल्ड सेक्शन आई विल जस्ट शो यू क्विकली यू नो दिस इज दिस इज एरेशन आई एम टॉकिंग अबाउट micro aeration coming from the bottom this is a small system good for about 7 to 8 people iska jo aeration de rahe hain wo hamara ye rehta hai na aquarium ghar ka aquarium mein jo blower rehta hai wo blower se aeration ho raha hai itna kam power mein aisa systems ko bana sakte hain they are very effective we are doing it for different different villas in many places so any other question or uh, otherwise uh, maybe uh, manthi can take over thank you i was already raising hand jayati to even ask questions uh, but i think our time is running very uh, fast with this interesting conversation but let me still pose very simple question uh, and it is uh, directly related to uh, what we are doing and what we should be doing so uh, both of them may just pitch in one or few lines so the way we are doing lake development across the country it seems uh, all the developers the local authorities architects designers planners have no clue about microfights and macrofights 
because uh, we are just you know concretizing and stone uh, edging all the water systems and we are deepening the water bodies in the name of dredging because where, what we you are talking about macrophytes and um, also microphytes they are basically wetland species when and that means they are shallow water species and we also learn those of who, we, who are into ecology oriented and learn ecology we know that the shallower the water body the richer the ecosystem is so my question to both of you uh, is that are we actually developing enough ic material or awareness material for those who implement these projects i mean teaching in classroom and doing our own project is extremely important but why aren't local authorities aware about it why are consultants unaware about it why are uh, you know local contractors civil engineers are not taught about it and what is the effort which is done by people like you who are working in this field do we have enough ic materials to sub, uh, circulated so that they don't repeat this kind of lake lake deepening and lake stoning and concretizing so my question to both of you can i answer first please, please go ahead please, sir please okay so uh, mansi you very rightly pointed out this thing actually what is happening uh, as a teacher i have been uh, coming in contact of uh, younger generation for the last 20 25 years and jayati is one of them yes <laughs> uh, actually the whole thing is uh, people know about the environment nowadays we have created enough uh, material uh, they understand actually the thing is uh, we have to go uh, on kap survey knowledge aptitude and practice so we have knowledge Uh, sometimes we lack the aptitude then comes the practice so when it comes to the practice uh, then uh, that is the point where uh, we are failing actually i think and this is the uh, the whole thing is related to our mindset we know the things we know we hum jante hain ki ye water body hai ye hai isko nature we have to conserve green everything is green green clothing green this green consumer everything is green nowadays but the thing is when it comes to practice so hamara jab tak we will not change the mindset of our users actually because the planners the developers they are working for us for the users so it is the user which has just the mindset has to be changed ki wo ek sustainable lifestyle and as our prime minister has already introduced this life initiative so life for uh, environment so this all thing is, is related to our uh, mindset so now uh, we need to change the mindset of the younger generation and i think such type of uh, programs such type of sessions uh, we are holding here will be definitely they will be helpful in changing the mindset of the users of new generation thank you i think uh, uh, mass uh, 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 awareness on biodiversity is very crucial uh, yes solution uh, yes uh, mr reddy um, i think uh, we have to popularize vyas ji more you know he is the right person he is a limnologist you know his his knowledge and experience is tremendous you know people should consult and there is no forum where people are framing these guidelines for excavation or bonding and all that there are no guidelines given like the cpho manual has published for sewage treatment and for highways there is a guidelines so like that the guidelines has to be published and propagated there is a, a division started in delhi you know before this current government uh, under the minister uh, there is it is related to lakes only there was a department started and they perhaps did not communicate enough your mansi your question is correct we must be able to Uh, give this uh, information to those people who are uh, doing these lakes especially if it is bangalore there is a different department hyderabad there is a different department at least those department must be given formally that what they should do some don'ts of these lakes because these are the wealth that we have and anywhere we are losing these wetlands you now around the lakes we are in a, in a in a very difficult situation for the benefit of a few people that have asked some questions in the chat i will take only 2 minutes to show something okay. very uh, important um because the opportunity to meet them again i don't know when so this is about nala people are asking about how do we remediate nala certain nalas can be remediated these are some technologies that we deploying for nalas which where the water column is about a meter 
मीटर एंड हाफ अगर वाटर कॉलम इज ओनली फोर इंच सिक्स इंच बह रहा है उसमें ज्यादा करने की मौका नहीं मिलती है वी शुड बी एबल टू डू सम चेक डैम्स इन ऑल दैट बट वेन यू डू चेक डैम्स यूर चैलेंज इज वेट वेदर फ्लो बिकॉज वेट वेदर यू नो इफ इट इज वन मिलियन लीटर फ्लोइंग इन ए डे ड्यूरिंग रेनी सीजन इट्स हंड्रेड मिलियन लीटर सो वी हैव टू डिजाइन दिस नाला ट्रीटमेंट एंड सर्टनली वन हंड्रेड परसेंट एग्री विथ यू सर दैट वी शुड नॉट डिपेंड ऑन एस टी पीज ऑल द टाइम टू ट्रीट द वाटर दैट मच मनी आर कंट्री डजेंट हैव and we don't have to do it because by the time this reaches stps this street in noida they lose their air conditioning uh, unit the compressors every year because of the way the ammonia and all that you know gets from out from these nalas they get rusted and some of the refrigerators also go away so we cannot wait for all this water to pass through a city few kilometers and reach an stp we must be able to handle remediation and there are technologies available for that now some of the water bodies they can be treated through bioremediation certain micro minimal aeration systems uh, when we ideally the nature based solutions they must be something that they should enable the food web they should not disturb anything we should not add anything that affects the aquatic life that doesn't go in tandem with the lake ecology so because of the nutrients only this whole story begins so we should find ways to exhaust the nutrients in natural methods where once the nutrients are exhausted the water body re retains its uh, original you know uh, shape so these are some of the case studies that we implemented through um, methods that are very engineered but again following the principles of ecology not damaging anything within the water body actually rather helping the food web within the water body to flourish we are talking about if every lake in india gets this kind of a wetland ring deliberately made for every lake imagine the way the lakes will be protected from encroachments imagine the way that rain water actually goes through these filters and still doesn't reach there you can easily manage it and positive bacteria every time the water passes through a root system it sends a positive bacteria from the roots into the water body which can potentially remediate your uh, polluted lake also gradually we will require in, in many cases we will require some level of uh, 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 aeration assistance because the pollution loads are so high by yes. itself the water body can remediate but we don't have that much time by the time this curates you know another load is coming so we may have to take assistance surface aeration systems do not work it's a waste of energy it's they're, they're more ornamental so we have to fundamentally look at the strata at the bottom of the lake if sludge has been deposited for a for a you know meter to meter what do you do with that that is what is leaching the toxics from the bottom constantly so we'll have to do a bio dredging where we can deploy certain compounds where the sludge can be consumed gradually and dredging can never be permitted to touch the hard strata of a soil bottom the it takes uh, hundreds of years for a silt to form for it to actually bring to that state and that's a wealth of bacterial colony that exists there so i mean it's a cruelty that you know uh, having have the science we are still you know going back to very crude methods of handling the lakes unfortunately you know we can preach each other but uh, like mansi said that action has to be taken at the level where certain guidelines must be given and limnologists across the country must be activated their services must be sought after because they are the authorities on the subject not some civil engineer but i the civil engineers are very, not good yeah very well put point but i think uh, as as scholars and practitioners we really have to set aside a certain amount of time to do these ic materials whereas we are we are really more focused on uh, of course few, a very small number our outreach is not increasing and that's extremely a pity and uh, which also gives us an opportunity to start talking about why not create small greeting cards about these things and just send it to people free you know why not give it to architects planners and local authorities for free and that has to be taken as a social responsibility apart from teaching and working on these fields and i take it, i take these things very seriously if your uh, fraternity is interested we can really take it up and just prepare those ic materials and send it to people that please do like this and don't do like this you know it's do's and don'ts very simple let me just invite um, i'm sorry i'm just extending this conversation because there is a very uh, urgent uh, request from bismay wadiwala would you like to speak up uh, because you say it is your first time and we really appreciate all the participants who have who join our sessions bismay are you still around yes like yes yes ma'am can you hear me yes we hear you continue yeah thank you 
thank you very much for giving me this platform right now. I'm an urban designer and architect, practicing since 20 years in India. Uh, and every time we are working for some city development projects. And so it's very interesting uh, to for me to understand these microfights from you guys. And this is very, very much connected to my upcoming project, which I'm working on a Jalgaon. And in that case, also that we have the fundamentals of the Nalas and all. So we are may, actually we are working on a Vedic theories. Basically, in India, there is very very few architects and urban designers are working on a Vedic theories to develop our own culture and all. Because we are all you know very much uh, fascinated with the uh, Western cultures and you know all our structures. Every time we are making structures, structures. Nobody is caring about some you know uh, environmental uh, kind of. Uh, you know, the thing is though, so we, we are, as a person since 20 years, we are trying our hardest to get into the environment concerns and make us uh, building according to the environment requirement, you know. So uh, this is the nice, uh, uh, nice gesture for me right now to understand what the scene are going on. And I'm looking, actually, I'm, I was searching for this Nala treatment and all by the, uh, you know, by the Vedic way. And this is, I think, Vedic ways and Vedic cultures we have already uh, using those things in the past for Purans and Vedas. So, DG, this is very nice things you are doing right now. And I got a lot of uh, answers from your end from this chat box. And uh, in this case, uh, in the city which we are working right now, it is very, very much impo impossible to make a STP every time with the Nalas. But uh, I want to create those Nalas as a uh, river, uh, you know, you can say the waterfront element. And according to the both side, we want to develop a ecological, uh, your biodiversity park and all. So we are actually having a conceptual space right now. And we have some meetings on 19th and 20th from the uh, commissioner and all uh, IS officers. We are going to present these things. So this is the best work for me right now. So very much happy to hear the positive all, all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And if you want, uh, want to connect again, then let me know. Sure. Please, please, uh, please stay tuned to our www.w4w.in because we are regularly okay. talking about these things. And since you yeah. are architect, urban designer, we also share our profession with each other. So I will be very keen to see how you really take it up after the learnings. Because yeah. unfortunately, in architecture, planning, urban design, we are not teaching about water. And exactly. we are not teaching about biodiversity. We are not teaching about, of course, many other things, which is only about construction, building and all. And mm -hmm. still it is far. I am uh, doing my own struggle to make water as a part of education in architecture, urban design. Likewise, I invite limnology, biodiversity, ecology to be part mm -hmm. of uh, built environment education because unless and until the pedagogy of uh, built environment changes, I don't see change in the practice because most of the architects are given projects to build and designers and planners are given projects to build and what they learn in school and colleges is building and that's why they build. <laughs> so it is unfortunate, but I think we can have this discussion <laughs> some other time. And yes. um, we, sure. I, I'm also developing a little book on what not to do on urban lakes. And this is an important <laughs> part of my book writing. Uh, so hopefully next year we will we'll see what not to do because most of the time we talk about what to do. So uh, now, Jayati, with your due permission, may I just close the session because otherwise uh, it's quite a long session. Yes, yes, yes. Please. The sessions have been always so interesting that we just don't feel like uh, stopping the session. But let yeah. me to uh, thank first of all to Jayati because you have been really making a tremendous effort to get some wonderful speakers from around the country. So thank you so much, Jayati. And it is really a great, a great honor for me to know you as a person also now and a good friend. And uh, thank you, Professor Vipin Vyas. Uh, it's nearly now 13 years I meet you on this platform as my PhD respondent. You were uh, in 2011, but it's always great to hear you. I still refer your works. And thank you, Ganges Reddy. And I'm really looking forward to doing some work with you on NBS. Uh, and many lakes and all. And I'm going to connect you to some activities which are going on in this week on lakes of Hyderabad. So maybe you can really share your wisdom with people or more people of Hyderabad there. And our young discussant, Rajya Lakshmi, I'm sure she is more enlightened. I can see from her smile. And this is the whole purpose of Wednesdays for Water that we bring in at least one student at a time, one scholar at a time. And if we can change their heart towards these important issues, I will say as a teacher, as a scholar, that we win the game. So 
I really invite both Ganges and Vipin Sar and Jayati to really think very seriously how can we really make microfights as our friends and change people's perception. Very simple IC materials. Please let us think about it, design and get some scholars like Raji Lakshmi and more and let them do the internship and volunteer and prepare those IC materials and we just freely distribute to people and tell them that love your macrophytes. Don't think them as devils. Don't see that if there is a bush, it is a bad thing. So bush is not bad. We can really think of some catchphrases. Just like uh, we were talking about that macrophytes are not waste, but wealth. So with this, uh, I thank all the participants who have been really supporting this series. Let me just also tell you that on the coming Monday, we are going to touch 200 sessions. So it's not really easy to conduct these sessions every now and then, which is three sessions a week. And we are extremely grateful to all our participants. Nowadays, we have nearly twice the people attending on YouTube. So YouTubers also, we thank you for attending us. So with this, I announce the next week and then I officially uh, declare the session to be closed. So this Friday, which is just a day after, we have our uh, Friday Waters book reading session on 11th August. And this time it is at 4 p.m. because our scholar, our emeritus professor is from Australia. So it is uh, the time difference issue. So we had to respect. And we are talking about uh, his uh, their experiment on Marvi, an innovative approach for village level groundwater management. And Professor Vasant Maheshwari is going to share experience of his team across Rajasthan and the Western India. And that's at 4 p.m. Usually all our sessions are at 5 p.m. Next Wednesday, which is Wednesdays for Water, we are continuing with our Riverscape series, which is hosted by uh, Nishant Padhyay from Dharatal of Lucknow and Belgium. And we are talking about our river, our life, and we have two extremely young, enthusiastic um, scholars and activists from the ground who are going to talk about how they are going bit by bit and restoring rivers and really taking youth along in this whole process. So um, me, Mansi Balbhargav, and also uh, the person who conceptualized this whole talk series as an open knowledge bank for everyone, because we are very far from teaching water in this country. I really thank all of you as we reach 200, it makes me very emotional. And we are really looking forward to continue it as long as we can. And at least we are knowing that we are continuing for a few more weeks as we plan it accordingly. Thank you so much, all of you. Please take care and we look forward yeah. to being here. Uh, yeah, so thank you so much. And please don't forget to uh, join us next month. Yes. That's uh, 13th of September, second Wednesday of September. And please stay tuned uh, for an exciting journey to uh, this wonderful aquatic world with another interesting species. So see you yes. again on 13th. Oh.